the themes of our day today, uh, to take them in uh, inside out order, uh, is instant urbanism, infrastructure, landscape, and I would argue all of that equals waste from a, a certain perspective. Waste gives you each of those things, and I'm going to talk about them briefly um, today, and I'm going to make sure I watch my time. Uh, the first question of waste is, is one of definition, and I know this has been um, discussed already today a little bit, but it, it bears uh, a, a little more scrutiny, I think. The idea of ruins, um, waste, of course, there are architecture wastes, forms of waste and architectural uh, remnants that uh, the slides we just saw that Javier showed at the Grand Tour are vivid evocations, and even in places of course, like New York, any large urban conglomeration has these examples of impulses and aspirations that were perhaps uh, spectacular, but then met uh, an unanticipated and unhappy end, except not an end because they're still there. And so how do we consider and use and think creatively about this element of destruction as um, Javier and Chris just mentioned, the destructive, inherent tendency of urbanness that, of course, also always has within it a creative potential. Um, Tim Edensor's work looks at ruins in uh, a way a little bit akin to this that is quite um, provocative and, I think, um, fruitful for cultural analysts and architects and planners and designers. There are the leftovers, waste as leftover. This is the guts of archaeology in many um, in many corners of the world, both contemporary archaeology of the contemporary past, as William Ratchey demonstrated so ably, and also, of course, of the ancient. Um, then there are the accidental discards, the lost, the forgotten, the, uh, and this extends not just to objects, but also, again, to architecture. Here in New York, uh, uh, a beautiful and tragic example are the officers' houses in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, at the, uh, uh, that's a facility that some of you may be familiar with. And I should add a caveat here that my own, uh, I'm a New Yorker who's a little provincial in my analysis today. I'm only really looking at New York City. So um, some of us do that now and then. This is an international gathering, I realize. Uh, but I'm stuck in New York. Um, and then there are the rejecteds. This is the category of waste that I think includes household garbage. And when talking about waste, uh, just on the street in a casual context, that, that's the form of waste that people usually mean when they talk about um, the problems of uh, trash um, and leftovers and discards of, of all sorts. They mean the smelly stuff that goes in the back of a garbage truck, for the most part. Um, I think some of the architectural legacy of waste, it, it teaches us that, or it hints at the fact that everything is always already ruined. This is where we sit here. These chairs in how many years? 10, 50, 100? They won't, if they are still here and have not been maintained pretty rigorously, they're not going to look anything like they do today with the pretty red and the you know, tears and most of the upholstery and the stairs are clean. And this, is, this is temporary. But we, um, we don't think that way. We don't live in that moment. Um, I don't know if we can live in that moment, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. Is this waste that we're looking at, this thing that's built which we don't have a use for, is this simply part of the regular cycling or pulsing of what are huge uh, self-organizing economic and ecological systems, or are we looking at something different, something in which uh, we're considering the end of resources? I'm not going to explain these, but uh, we're, we're familiar, of course, with the fact it's a much less elegant example of the diagram that Chris showed a little while ago, um, one of the characteristic diagrams in ecology to explain the way in which dynamic self-organizing systems uh, cycle through. They recycle their own resources, they cycle through states of organization, um, and it's taken as a, as a given that that's both a fact of ecological systems, uh, and it is in, it, it also probably serves a variety of purposes uh, in making them stronger and allowing them to innovate. We have here exactly the same language used to describe the business cycle, uh, here we see an idealized diagram of the business cycle, booms followed by busts, uh, liquidation of assets being um, the, the, the ethic for, for busts, uh, and then the reorganization that follows leading to the 
to the next boom. Uh, so it's a little mystery when we look at a project like Mazdar City, the ambitious no carbon, no waste, we'll see, uh, no waste city in, in um, Abu Dhabi, which, uh, like so many other projects, was caught short in 2008, stopped pretty much dead in its tracks. Uh, and yet we see now they've, uh, two of the central projects are, are continuing. And we expect, like that set of sidewalks in, in Shaker Heights, that over some period of time, whether it's years or decades, that this project will be uh, fulfilled. In other words, that it was the victim of a business cycle. Well, we shouldn't even say victim, that the, we should have expected the business cycle, that it, was, that it is simply uh, proceeding at the pace dictated uh, by the business cycle. Um, now, of course, that city was formed or was conceived with a very different object in mind, right? It's a city meant to prepare what is an incredibly wealthy uh, emirate, incredibly resource wealthy, uh, cash rich, in fact, as well, uh, to, to, to use the wealth that they have now to build uh, an infrastructure which will allow them to better uh, ride out the, the, um, what they anticipate to be the the change in flow of those resources in their in their city. And of course, I'm talking about the, both the limits to growth generally and the limits to urban growth in particular. This is a very simple diagram. I, I promised only show one Howard Odom diagram today. Um, but the, the, the premise, the simple premise being that if we're looking uh, at these big systems, we should look at what drives them, uh, and in this case, and what, and what limits them. And in this case, the simple answer is there's two kinds of things that limit the growth of one is a reduction in the flow of things required to fuel that growth, whether we're talking about oil or cash or water or food. Uh, and the second is consequences from the, the waste that goes back out, the limiting effects of various forms of, of pollution. Um, but what we see in a, and again, a very simplified form, the characteristic diagram there is that the, the city in this case grows to the point at which it encounters limits that prohibit its further growth, and then if there is not a change in those flows, uh, it declines. Second project is uh, about uh, a, a city that surrounds uh, the uh, industrial suburbs of, of, of Madrid, Azuqueca. Azuqueca de Nares uh, is in a very important corridor, and uh, 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 previously has been mentioned also, the one that communicates basically Madrid with, uh, with Zaragoza and Zaragoza with uh, uh, Barcelona. Uh, and, and there is a kind of uh, interesting industrial structure there, uh, structure there. Uh, warehouses and factories are like um, very close to the airport, very close to Madrid, but out of the community of Madrid because it's cheaper. And these uh, um, suburbs have uh, in, increased their size tremendously while the bubble uh, was um, growing. And in a moment, uh, in this case, in Azuqueca, the, the, the population was uh, multiplied by three, by three in, in 15 years, and, and, and in two years, the, the, the people uh, without jobs increased till 50 percent of these people. I mean, uh, so uh, again, uh, we have a kind of a waste of energy. You know, a, a lot of potential in, in labor uh, energy was. Uh, destroy almost automatically, and the whole structures all over the territory and became um, obsolete. Well, one of the things that we, I mean, the, the municipality was interested in maintaining these people alive, so to say, participating in, in the public life of, of Azuqueca, and the paradox of, of, of asking us about uh, uh, how to, to could we organize a, a laser center or something. For these people, uh, the paradox came when we uh, compare the, the structure of, of, of the Miljunin Illinois city, the, the perfect utopia of, of labor, everything is organized in a perfect diagram, was almost identical uh, to the structure of, of uh, Henares, when you have the train, you have the highway, you have the river, you have the plains, the wind is in the exactly in the opposite side to the factories. So, so, the, the, the pollution doesn't come to the, the neighborhood, etc. And there's this little dot in the in back, back, the rectangular dot in the in the left side of the, of the Miljunin proposal that is the laser center for the, for, for the workers, uh, and and there is, is exactly the same thing for us. No? But but in this case, it was the use and the intention and everything was exactly reversed in a way. No? Is to give some kind of activity to those that don't have any. For us, it was interesting to try to, to mix this with uh, 
uh, other ways to, inter uh, to, un uh, to understand the thermodynamism of this process, trying to make a very cheap, uh, uh, obviously, um, uh, um, building that uh, at the same time could be flexible and at the same time could be uh, almost self-sufficient. So we use some basic technologies, a lot of uh, expansion in the open air because the, 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 the climate um, <coughs> of the suburbs of Madrid allow us to have like six, six to seven months of comfort out, outside. And we uh, began to, to work with uh, uh, a very schematic thing. I mean, the same pattern of, 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 of Miljunin, a kind of architecture, also gave way to another factory. It's, it's like five meters tall. It's a very simple shed that was divided in, in a labyrinth of rooms of different sizes, some of them open air to facilitate cross ventilation, and a glass facade to the south to facilitate the heat gains in, in winter, and a gradient of activities to the north, uh, those that require less heat because the heat is produced by the body, like a gym, and in the south, those that require more heat. I mean, it, it was a very simple scheme that has proved to be working very well, uh, at least these two years. Let's see if it lasts. I was just trying to think about uh, that question of whether waste was inherently bad. Um, because it was a little bit what I started by saying, which is that so much of the assumption about or with environmental concerns, and I realize the topic here is broader, has to do with an automatic assumption that waste is bad, and therefore the project is simply the elimination of waste, which I think um, is tremendously confusing. I think it's not that I'm inherently against external moral arguments, but I don't think that it actually helps us much uh, in our work. Um, and I do think, I mean, if I restate the point, it's because I think it's uh, what I've been thinking about since you, since you framed it, uh, which is that um, waste has different meanings in different contexts uh, and, at, and at different times. And um, I think if we ask what's the purpose of the I wrote an article recently uh, that started with uh, the note that my mother uh, put next to the thermostat in our house, which said, if you're cold, put on a sweater. Uh, <laughs> and I think there's a real purpose to that, to the moral imperative uh, against waste. In that case, it was, don't spend the family's money on something that doesn't need to be spent on. We want to use those resources for something else. So I think one has to put that moral approach, I think, in a larger context and ask, what are we doing together and why are we doing it? I mean, this is like any public discussion. We come to them trying to talk about what, what, what form of the common good are we trying to realize in this situation. And, and I think in some cases, efficiency helps get you there. And in other cases, I think it's a distraction. And given all that we've seen today, simply makes it possible to build more, bigger, faster, uh, and then when, when you mentioned digestive processes and scatological benches, um, when I speak of flow in terms of waste, I think of that very much as a, an organistic process, a respiratory and excretory process, which implies recycling in the deeper sense of well, energy is never lost. It's reformed, but then it can be reclaimed. So if we think of, if we remember that flow is inherent to these systems, um, both practically but also cognitively. To, it, it changes a little bit the, the approach, I think, that is possible. And Bill, when you talk about frugality and the note next to the thermostat, um, and Javier's question about the expiatory element of recycling, I'm going to uh, toss out a statistic here. If every person in the United States recycled every element of uh, uh, personal garbage, household waste, completely 100%. If we had 100% diversion, in other words, in the solid waste language, the waste stream of the United States would be reduced by 3%. <laughs> so I invite us all to think about scale far beyond the thermostat and the plastic bottle, and that as designers, as architects, as planners, as anthropologists, as thinkers, as citizens, that we recall 
not recall, but we sort of start to shout that the horizon is far grander and more unsettling than whether or not we get the bottle into the right bag on the way to the curb. That's important, but we have been taught that it's enough, and it's not. So yes, recycling is expiatory because it's it feels good to have less going into the garbage than it goes into reuse and recreation, remaking. But it's too small still. And um, this group has a remarkable uh, collective talent to point toward these issues of scale um, in ways that involve design and relationships of materials flows into and out of systems in these respiratory, expiratory, scatological, and um, uh, compostable ways. So I'll just, I'll just toss all that out there. I, just, I mean, because I think um, in some ways it's, I, I'm glad that you brought that point up because as the three of you are presenting, the thing that came sort of coming back to my mind is what's the time threshold that we're designing for? What's the, what's the permanence, the duration that we're actually trying to participate in? Because at some level, you know, I think you can make the argument the worst thing that humankind did was settle permanently, right? Like with the point when we were migratory and when we were transient, there was a certain uh, there was a certain uh, rationale to that. But once you, you sort of uh, set down a uh, permanent uh, place, you're then confronted with the challenges of maintaining that or not maintaining that. Um, and so I think when we just sort of step it back further to thinking about urbanization, to thinking about large scale settlement, that question of what is the time threshold? What is the duration that we need to be operating on uh, in terms of uh, either anticipating these interruptions or inflections or failures, I think we, you know, we could still use that term, um, or uh, versus just initiating a process and sort of stepping back and figuring out when to re-participate in that process after we've initiated it. Failure, like destruction, is both a negative and a positive. As, as you wrote in some of the material prelude to this event today, um, there's an immense creative potential in failure um, that I think is uh, always there and sometimes overlooked. Uh, sorry, I was trying to actually answer the question as opposed to go to the next uh, thought, which is inspired. But uh, that's fine. That's, that's well, no, no, I think. No, because I think there is an interesting, this, this time for the living building challenge, they would say 100 years. That's their new, got to build for 100 years. But of course, for building, the question is which part of the building should last 100 years? Surely the paint finish shouldn't last 100 years, and the whole point of furniture, the mobility, is to, to be able to change and move around. So I think there's always, of course, time scales. Um, but no, push me to the next question, which was, so time scale is one thing, but um, we talk about it. We often talk about these things as if we decided that we're going to live the way we live. Um, and yes, in lots of incremental, in, in, uh, discrete decisions made by billions of people, we have decided that we're going to live the way we live. Um, but it's more a question, I think, uh, at least for the last millennia, of making do as we have grown. Meaning, as, as the population has continued to expand, we're pushed. We, we could not all be nomads on the you just, the, that density is impossible. Uh, and the examples we have of low density cities um, in South, uh, Southeast Asia and in uh, Yucatan, they, they reached some limit that was not possible to go beyond. We've been able to, to go beyond that. And in fact, nobody decided we should have cities of 25 million. I never heard that, never heard any mm -hmm. meeting that got together and said, that's it, our cities are too small. What we need are giant collections of people. Um, so I think, it's always important to recognize the degree to which our work is provisional in dealing with forces that are both beyond our control and made up of those millions of decisions. But, but I have to ask, so 3%, where's the other 97%? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in, um, manufacturing and industrial processes, it's in agriculture, it's in mining waste, medical waste, CND. Um, in New York City, the, the uh, number 11,000 tons is tossed around as the garbage total for the day. In fact, that's a roughly a third of the city's garbage output. That's household waste. So C&D and um, uh, commercial waste.
waste just in New York that makes up another total of about 48 to 50 thousand tons. But but nationally, and um, we don't have the kinds of laws about extended producer responsibility and other sorts of interventions from government regulation that are more common in Europe than the EU that um, divert materials at different points in the process than is possible here. In the, Uni in the United States, it's the consumer who, uh, on whose shoulders the responsibility for diversion and, re and uh, recycling really rests, um, which is uh, a difficult charge since the consumer has very little control over the processes that put a given set of choices in front of her. So um, it's, it's a little bit about, if we think of it as sort of the, the hermeneutic circle, at what, what's our vantage point? What's our perspective? Where do we stand to look at the central problem? In, in going back to Javier's question of turning, um, or I guess Inyaki's question, turning shit into gold, <laughs> what if it already is gold, but we just don't understand it that way yet? Um, that's a, a colleague of mine accuses me of trying to foster a secret agenda of getting everybody to love garbage. Like love, I don't mean like think, okay, okay it's kind of cool, but I mean love garbage, <laughs> sensually. Just, and that's, he says, impossible given the anthropological reality that disgustingness has a certain all cultures have things that are disgusting, and they tend to have similar traits of like sliminess and moistness where it shouldn't be moist, and categories of objects that are smeared together when they should be distinct and discreetly separate. If you have that combination of factors, it's gross all over the world. So I say, no, no, we should love that. He says, no, that's absolutely, we are not, that, we don't do that. It's not a human, we, keep, we don't do that. So maybe I have to pull back from this potential secret agenda of saying we love our garbage. I'm not sure if I actually have. But to understand it not as an end point, but as a resource. Yeah. Waste companies make bajillions of dollars. Some of the wealthiest private corporations on the planet are waste management companies. Why is that? Partly because it's an expensive infrastructural set of processes, but also because they've got a, a very um, fer fertile resource that they're mostly not using in a creative way, but that we could uh, redirect, I think. Imagine if it weren't a transfer station, but a repurposing center. If it weren't a, um, if, if the boutique compost efforts here in New York and in other parts of the United States were not boutique, but structurally integrated into the way we understand how to deal with organic waste. Um, it's been done successfully in a few parts of the world. Edmonton, Canada has a, an amazing facility but it's out in the middle of a cornfield where even on bad days when the smell gets a little ripe outside the building, there's not a whole lot of population to complain. So there are very real constraints in an urban setting, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and part of the answer, I believe, lies in pushing the definition into some new directions. So shit into gold, shit is gold already. Mm -hmm. I've heard this called compost theology. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually thinking of Spain and thinking of some of your work in Yaki and some of Anique's work. I mean, there was a point in time where waste was being celebrated in the context of Spain, right? The, the facility yeah. that you showed at the end. I mean, these were significant architectural and urbanistic commissions that were being deployed to, in essence, at least make public or begin to make legible that that sort of process was happening at that point. Um, I don't know, from your perspective, whether that fundamentally changed people's perception of waste or not, or if it was just another civic landscape no, that it was, was installed? It became, uh, uh, in, I mean, uh, 10 years or 15 years ago, it became a, a very important political issue, I would say. I mean, it was a way to distinguish some politics from, from others. And so it was, in, in a moment, it, was, it became a, com a competition among different parties in order to, to show off uh, which one was more clean, green, or whatever you call it. And I, I think that uh, the, the, the contribution that we architects made were, was that uh, uh, it, could, uh, the, the, it could be more, uh, the investment could be more um, um, publicly uh, interesting, uh, making it visible. Making, making it uh, visible or possible to visit these places. I remember that we won the competition for the biggest, in those days, biggest recycling plant of Europe in Madrid. Uh, we only spent uh, in a plant that had like 20,000 square meters, we only increased the size 
within 200 uh, square meters to give room for a little um, environmental room, and and we increase the passerelles over over the whole processes in one meter of width, so the schools could go hang on overseeing the orange <laughs> and all the stuff in the morning, in the afternoon, etc., etc. And it was, uh, I mean, uh, I think one of the most clever ideas we had in those days. I mean, in terms of giving visibility and making it super didactical for the politicians. Super, uh, interesting in terms of votes. I think it, was, it wasn't it just, just to finish your interest, it wasn't it a dignification of, um, yeah. of, of waste treatment? Yeah, in, fa in fact, it, in the first moment, I mean, they were really uh, concerned about uh, showing this or not, and so I mean, and, and we said, okay, I mean, it's so cheap, it's only two, I mean, it's, it's nothing compared to the investment, so let's see, and if it works, and now, I mean, there are so many visits that uh, when we go with our students to, to visit, we have to wait a long list of months, uh, we cannot visit. I think there might be a nice moment of, of geek pride in the popular culture that uh, uh, helps this cause. The, one of the most popular tours you can take in New York City is the wastewater treatment plant in, on the Newtown Creek in uh, 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 Greenpoint, Brooklyn, Queens, on the border. Um, they sell out within an hour or so. There was a special Valentine's Day tour that they offered that sold out so quickly they added they added more that also sold out very fast. It is architecturally a grand and a completely unlikely um, space with it's called the eggs. So, uh, do you know this space? Have you? you yes. Does everybody? Okay. So did, did anyone talk about the eggs today? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. okay. Well, but and it's lit at night with different colors and it, it is the when it's done. Perhaps in our lifetime, it will be the yeah. largest sewage treatment plant in the world, and uh, part of its mission has become helping the public celebrate that, rather than the appall that this has to exist within the somewhere in the neighborhood. And they are working to be better neighbors, speaking of the neighborhood, so that uh, the residents nearby are not um, as stressed as would have been the case in the past. But how how unlikely is it that one of the most popular things you could have done on Valentine's Day was take your sweetheart to a sewage treatment plant? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's interesting that because in some ways, and, and I mean, we can sort of continue to discuss this throughout the, the rest of the day, but in some ways this goes back to the very first panel, which we will hear for Robin, but this notion that infrastructure is always mobility infrastructure in terms of the way that we begin the conceptualization of the city, yet there is this real fascination with uh, the other utilities of the city that aren't as legible, that aren't as present, whether it's waste. Uh, water services, electricity, where the power comes from, where the coal plants are. That that, that actually, as a to use uh, uh, the term that was being um, uh, employed in the first panel, that sort of geography, when it becomes legible, actually has a real sort of, um, uh, it's, it's compelling. There's a draw that's able to be uh, captured from that. Yet it's not necessarily this thing that we, we as designers embrace as a kind of occasion to rethink the city. We embrace the imageability of the city, not the sort of systemic uh, aspect of the city, which in fact has a kind of cultural potential to it, even if it is not widely recognized.